Hey everyone, welcome to the online program of Amrita IAS Academy. My name is C.B. Joy and as part of our monthly current affair MCQ series, in this video we will be discussing part 2B of July 2020. So without any delay, we will just go into the questions. In context of parotas, consider the following statements. 1. This layered flat bread has originated from the Indian subcontinent and is very popular in northeastern India. 2. Kuthu parotas are awarded, are awarded with the geographical indicator or the GI tag. Choose the correct code. Option A, 1 only. Option B, 2 only. Option C, both 1 and 2. And option D, none of the above. So, taking the context of parotas, it is not very popular in the northeastern part of India, but rather it is very popular in the southern part of India. So, it is a very famous South Indian dish. So, taking that into account, I can say that the first statement is wrong because it says it is very popular in the northeastern part of India. The second statement, Kotha parotas are awarded with the geographical indicator tag, but no, it is not yet awarded. Uh, such tags have not been awarded to Kotha parotas. So, I would definitely say the answer is option D, none of the above. Let us look at the explanation. The Karnataka Bench of Authority for Advanced Rulings has said that packaged parotas would attract a GST of 18 percentage because unlike plain rotis and khakras, which have a 5 percentage GST, they need to be heated before consumption. Before consumption. So, that was the reason it was there in the news. The first statement is not correct because parota is a layered flat bread originating from the Indian subcontinent made from maida flour which is popular in southern India. The word parota is generally used for the Malabar or Kerala parota. It is a popular street and restaurant food across the state and is usually served with beef fry. Second statement is not correct because the parotas are not awarded with the GA tags. So that is the explanation for this question. Let us go for the next question. In context of equalization levy, consider the following statements. One. It aims at taxing the digital transactions, that is, the income accruing to foreign e-commerce companies from India. Two, it is a direct tax. Choose the correct code. Option A, one only. Option B, two only. Option C, both one and two. And option D, none of the above. So, looking at the equalization levy, this was present in the news. Uh, and it was a very important news because it was aimed at taxing the digital transactions where the money which was being accrued by the foreign e-commerce companies, there was a need for a tax on them. And since it is being applied on them directly, then there is no possibility of that burden being shifted. It was also a direct tax. So, taking that into account, I can say that <coughs> the option C, both 1 and 2 are absolutely right. Let us go for the explanation. The answer is C. Statement 1 is correct because equalization levy was introduced in India in 2016 with the intention of taxing the digital transactions, that is the income accruing to foreign e-commerce companies from India. It is aimed at taxing business to business transactions. The second statement is correct because equalization levy is a direct tax which is withheld at the time of time of payment by the service recipient. The two conditions to be met to be liable to equalization levy, the payment should be made to a non-resident service provider. The annual payment made to one service provider exceeds rupees 1 lakh in one financial year. So that is the explanation for this. It is a bit of a technical question but just know it is a direct tax and it is being uh, placed upon the uh, digital transactions of the foreign e-commerce companies, especially to, to the income being accrued by them with regards to uh, business to business transactions. So, that is the idea behind this. Let us go for the next question. Sharavati lion tailed macaque sanctuary is located in which of the following Indian state? A. Telangana, B. Tamil Nadu, C. Kerala and D. Karnataka. So, Sharavati lion tailed macaque sanctuary. So, lion tailed macaque is generally present in the western Ghats and it is very common in the Nilgiri biosphere. So, taking that into account, I like to make a logical assumption that either it is in B, Tamil Nadu or C, Kerala or D, Karnataka. But at the same time, uh, all these three states have the lion tail macaque and it is going to be a bit hard for us to know. But since it is a ABCD type of question also, it is hard for us to identify some kind of logic to eliminate certain things. So, in this case, if you have read the newspaper, you definitely know that the Sharavati lion tail macaque sanctuary is actually in the state of Karnataka, that is option D. Let us look at the explanation. The answer is D. Sharavati LTM Wildlife Sanctuary is a protected wildlife sanctuary in the western Ghats of Karnataka state in India. It is named after the Sharavati river flowing through the sanctuary. The sanctuary is spread across the forests of Uttara Kannada and Shivamoga districts of Karnataka. Sharavati reservoir is present within the sanctuary. The expanded sanctuary is aimed at protecting the freshwater habitat of Myristica swamps that host many species like the lion tailed macaque leaf nosed bats, hornbills, etc. The lion tailed macaque or the macaca silenus is classified as endangered by the IUCN. The Sharavati lion tailed macaque wildlife sanctuary 
has southern tropical evergreen type of forest and southern tropical semi evergreen type of forest too. So that is the explanation about the Sharavati lion tail macaque wildlife sanctuary. We will go for the next question. Consider the following statements about the Ganga river. One, it is a transboundary river which flows through China, India and Bangladesh. Two, some of its major tributaries are Gomti, Gomti Ghagra, Punpun and Damodar. Three, it is home to the critically endangered garial species. Select the correct answer using the given below code. Option A 1 only, option B 2 and 3 only and option C 1 and 2 only and option D none of the above. So, we will be learning about the Ganges river as part of our geography as part also of our environment and one thing we have learnt <coughs> while talking about the Ganga river is it originates in India especially in Uttarakhand. So, it does not flow through China. So, taking that into account we can say the first statement is wrong. Remove the first statement you are left with just options B, 2 and 3 and option D none of the above. So, now we need to confirm just either if option 2 or 3 if either one of them is right automatically the option gets eliminated and the answer B becomes right. But if we are if both the statements are wrong then the option D which is none of the above becomes right. Let us look at the option second and third. Some of its major tributaries are Gomti, Ghagra, Punpun and Damodar and three it is home to the critically endangered garial species. Both of the statements are right because while learning about the tributaries of the Ganga, Gomti, Gagara, Punpun and Damodar are its tributaries. So, since the second statement is right and the third statement the garial species, the critically endangered garial species is also present in the Ganga, both of them are right and we will go with the answer that option B 2 and 3 is the right one. Let us look at the explanation. The statement 1 is not correct because the Ganges or the Ganga is a transboundary transboundary river of South Asia which flows through India and Bangladesh. It originates from the Gangotri glacier of western Himalayas in the Indian state of Uttarakhand and flows south and east through the Gangetic plain of India and Bangladesh eventually emptying into the Bay of Bengal. The second statement is correct because the major left bank tributaries include the Gomti river, the Ghagra river, the Gantaki river and the Kosi river. The major right bank tributaries include the Yamuna, the Son, the Punpun and the Damodar river. The third statement is correct because the Ganges is home to approximately 140 species of fish and 90 species of amphibians. The river also contains reptiles and mammals including the critically endangered species such as the Garial and the South Asian river dolphin. So, that is the explanation for this question. Let us go for the next question. Consider the following statements about the national mission for manuscripts. One, it was launched by the Ministry of Home Affairs with the mandate of documenting and conserving, conserving knowledge preserved in the manuscripts. Two, objectives of the mission is to, is to publish rare and unpublished manuscripts. Three, reprinting of Mongolian Kanjur has been taken up under this mission. Which of the above mentioned statements are correct? Option A, 1 and 2 only, option B, 2 and 3 only, option C, 1 and 3 only and option D, all of the above. So, while looking at certain questions which are related to the governance or the polity structure of a country, one thing I will always like want uh, all these aspirants to notice, whenever such a body or a mission is talked about, look at the concerned ministry. Is the ministry really relevant towards this body? Now, this question is about national mission for manuscripts, but it was launched by the, it says that it was launched by the Ministry of Home Affairs. The Ministry of Home Affairs looks more towards the law and order and the internal security of the country. It does not have as much of a role to play towards the national mission for manuscripts. So, since there seems to be an illogical connection in that, let us remove the option 1 or oh, let us remove the first statement. When you remove the first statement, option A, C and D are eliminated and you are left with just one option which is option B, 2 and 3. That is objectives of the mission is to publish rare and unpublished manuscripts and three reprinting of Mongolian Kanjur has been taken up under this mission. Taking this into account, let us go with the option B that is 2 and 3 only. Let us look at the explanation. The answer is B. The statement 1 is not correct because the national mission for manuscripts was launched in February 2003 by the government of India under the Ministry of Tourism and Culture with the mandate of documenting, conserving and disseminating the knowledge preserved in the manuscripts. The second statement is correct because one of the objectives is to publish rare and unpublished manuscripts so that the knowledge enshrined in them is spread to researchers, scholars and general public at large. The third statement is correct because under the scheme, reprinting of 108 volumes of the Mongolian Kanjur has been taken up by the mission. It is expected that all the volumes will be published by March 2022. Mongolian Kanjur is the Buddhist canonical text in 108 volumes is considered to be the most important religious text in Mongolia. The, in the Mongolian language, Kanjur means concise orders and the words of Lord Buddha in particular. It is held in high esteem by the Mongolian Buddhists and they worship the Kanjur at temples and recite the lines of Kanjur in daily life as a sacred ritual. The Kanjur are kept almost in every monastery in Mongolia. 
Mongolian Kanjur has been translated from Tibetan. The language of the Kanjur is classical Mongolian. The Mongolian Kanjur is also a source of providing cultural identity to Mongolia. So that is the explanation about Mongolian Kanjur and the National Mission for Manuscripts that is uh, implemented under, under the Ministry of Tourism and Culture. So that is the explanation for this question. Let us go for the next question. In the context of Eastern Ghats, consider the following statements. These mountain ranges are older than the Himalayas and the Western Ghats. Two, it is spread across three Indian states. Three, the Eastern Ghats is listed among the World Heritage Sites. Choose the correct code, option A, one only, option B, two and three only, option C, one and three only and option D, all of the above. So looking at this, I can definitely say, let us take the third statement. The Eastern Ghats is listed among the World Heritage Sites. Uh, like I said, we will be learning about the World Heritage Sites, what they are and which are the sites which are present in India. We will be learning it as part of our environment syllabus or our geography syllabus. So while learning about that, one thing we will definitely know that the Eastern Ghats is not among the World Heritage Sites which is listed in India. Knowing this, I can say that the third statement is absolutely wrong. Let us look at that. Let us remove the third statement and see. Option B has a st third statement, C has it, D has it. Option B, C, D are eliminated. We are left with just one option that is one only. Automatically, the second option is also left because it is spread across three Indian states. The Eastern Ghats is not restricted to three Indian states. It is uh, spread over more states too. Let us look at the explanation to see how we got the answer as one only. Statement 1 is correct because despite being older than the Himalayas and the Western Ghats, the Eastern Ghats, uh, an ancient discontinuous low mountain range that spreads along the east coast of Indian Peninsula never got its due. Statement 2 is not correct because the geographical extent of the Eastern Ghats is about 75,000 kilometers spread over the state of Odisha, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. The third statement is also not correct because the Western Ghats is listed among the World Heritage Site and the environmentalists are persuading authorities that the Eastern Ghats also deserve similar attention due to its unique biogeographic significance. Presently, the Eastern Ghats is not listed among the World Heritage Sites. So that is the explanation for this question. Let us go for the next question. In context of bad bank, consider the following statements. Number one, it buys non-performing assets and other illiquid holdings of other banks and financial institutions to clear their balance sheet. Two, the idea of forming a bad bank in India was first given by Raghur Amrajan Committee on Financial Sector Reforms. Choose the correct code, option A, one only, option B, two only, option C, both one and two and option D, none of the above. So looking at this, the second statement, the idea of forming a bad bank in India was first given by Raghuram Rajan Committee on Financial Sector Reforms is wrong because Raghuram Rajan was against the formation of a bad bank in India and taking that into account, I can say that the second statement is wrong. If the statement two is wrong, we are left with just two options that is option A, one only and option D, none of the above. So looking at the first statement, it buys non-performing assets and other illiquid holdings of other banks and financial institutions to clear their balance sheet. That is actually right. So we can say the first statement A1 only is the right answer. So this was present in the news for a few times. It was also present over the past few years also with regards to formation of bad banks and the government intervention to tackle the growing NPA crisis. Let us look at the explanation. The answer is say, the statement one is correct because a bad bank buys the bad loans or NPAs and other illiquid holdings of other banks and financial institutions which clears their balance sheet. The second statement is not correct because the idea of forming a bad bank was initially floated in January 2017 when the economic survey of India suggested setting up a public sector asset rehabilitation agency at the PARA and the RBA too came up with a suggestion to form two entities to clean up the bad loan problems ailing the public sector banks. The PAMC that is the private asset management company and the NAMC that is the national asset management company. In 2018, the government proposed a five prong strategy under the project Shashak to tackle stress in the banking sector and had formed a panel led by Mehta, the non-executive chairman of Punjab National Bank. Under the project, the committee had to float an AMC and an AIF to resolve the NPA over 500 crores. Former RBA governor Raghuram Rajan had opposed the idea of setting up a bad bank with a majority stake by banks arguing that it would solve nothing. <coughs> Rajan argued that a government funded bad bank would just shift loans from one government pocket that is the public sector banks to another that is the bad bank and did not see how it would improve matters. So the idea was the Raghura, former RBA governor Raghuram Rajan was against this and I generally given the expression talks about what is a bad bank and what, what are the associated, associated current affairs with relation to this. With this question, we will go for the next question. In context of Malabar excise, Consider the following statements. Number one, it began as a bilateral naval exercise between India and the US in 1992. Two, 
all quad countries participate in this annual war game choose the correct code option a one only option b two only option c both one and two and option d none of the above so in context of malabar exercise it's a two statement question it did begin as a bilateral naval exercise between india and us in 1992 that is a factual question you will be learning about the malabar exercise while learning about the different military exercises conducted by india with association with different countries so taking that i can say the statement one is right but the second statement all quad countries participate in this annual war game quad countries you will be learning what is quad but the key word you have to note in this is all so such an absolute directive is present in that and taking that into account i can say that this second statement seems to be highly Ill illogical so i can say that the first statement alone is right that is option a one only is the right answer let's go for the explanation statement one is correct malabar began as a bilateral naval exercise between india and the us in 1992 while and was expanded into a trilateral format with the inclusion of japan in 2015 whereas the second statement is not correct because australia has made repeated requests to join the exercises and in jan 2018 however india did not include the uh, include australia in the exercises in 2018 and 2019 India will take a decision on whether to include Australia in the Malabar exercises with Japan and the US at a defense ministry meeting according to a defense sources the decision if taken will bring all quad countries together as part of the annual war games so the coordinations are India USA Japan and Australia Australia has asked for permission to join the Malabar exercise India has not yet given it India has not yet decided so that was the reason this question has come about so that is the explanation for what is the Malabar exercise and what is quad Let's go for the next question. Consider the following statements about the Clean Technology Fund or the CTF. It is a part of the Climate Investment Funds or the CIFs. It was established to transfer clean technologies and incentives to emerging economies. Three, the Asian Development Bank is the trustee of the CTF Trust Fund, and four, the Reva Ultra Mega Solar Project has got funding from the CTF. Which of the above mentioned statements are correct? Option A, one, two, and four only. Option B, two, three, and four only. Option C, one, two, and three only. And option D, one and four only. So, uh, all the statements seem to be highly matching with clean technology and the clean technology fund. The first statement is a part of climate investment funds. It was established to transfer clean technologies. The Asian Development Bank is a trustee of the CTF, and the Reva Ultra Mega Ultra Mega Solar Project has got funding from that. But at the same time, uh, the Asian Development Bank. the asian development bank is not the trustee of the city of trust fund we will be learning about the major multilateral institutions like the world bank the imf the asian development bank all these things we will be learning about it and we can while learning about the asian development bank you will know that it is not the trustee of the city of trust fund but rather it is the world bank so uh, one must have an idea about who's the trustee and who's the manager of certain funds to know where the funding comes comes from and what their ambit is so in this case i can say that the asian development bank is not the right statement rather it is the world bank so taking that into account let's remove the third statement if you remove the third statement you are left with just two options that is option a 1 2 and 4 only and option d 1 and 4 only so automatically the first and the fourth fourth statements are right let's look at the second statement it was established to transfer clean technologies and incentives to emerging economies yes the second statement is right there is no absolute keywords or directives present in them So taking that into account, I can say the option A, one, two, and four only seems to be highly correct and logical. Let's go for the explanation. The answer is A. The CTF seeks to promote scaled-up financing for demonstration, deployment, and transfer of low-carbon technologies with significant potential for long-term greenhouse gas emission savings. The statement one is correct because the CTF and the Strategic Climate Funds are two multi-donor trust funds within the wider Climate Investment Funds or CIFs. Statement two is correct because the CTF was established in 2008 to provide emerging economies with positive incentives through public and private sector investments for the demonstration of low carbon development and mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions. Funding low carbon programs and projects that are embedded in national plans and strategies, scaling up development and accelerating the diffusion and transfer of clean technologies. So generally, have an idea of what the CTF is, and this is the explanation in CTF what it is. Looking at the third statement. The World Bank acts as the trustee for all climate investment funds, including the CTF. It holds in trust as a legal owner and administrator of the funds, assets, and receipts that contribute uh, that constitute the trust fund, pursuant to the terms entered into with the contributors. The World Bank Group, the African Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the European Development Bank, and the Inter-American Development Bank are the implementing agencies for the CTF investments. But the World Bank is the major trustee for the climate investment funds all the climate investment funds the fourth statement is also correct because the reva ultra mega solar 
plant is the first solar project in the country to break the grid parity barrier. It is one of the largest solar power plant in India. Beva Solar Power Plant is India's first solar project to get funding from the Clean Technology Fund which is available at a rate of 0.25 percentage for a 40 year period and it is from the World Bank. So, it is a big explanation try to get it try to read through it try to understand it what we have said and we will go for the next question. Consider the following statements about the Pradhan Mantri Kisan Urja Suraksha Evam Uthan Abhiya Mahabhiyan or the PM Kusum scheme. One Ministry of Power has launched the PM Kusum scheme for farmers for installation of solar pumps and other renewable power plants in the country. Two. It gives a continuous source of income to the rural landowners by utilizing their dry and uncultivable land. Which of the above mentioned statements are correct? Option A 1 only, option B 2 only, option C both 1 and 2 and option D none of the above. So, while preparing for UPSC, we will learn about many schemes and PM Kusum is one among them. But while always learning about the scheme, we will be also learning about the ministries which are involved in them. So, looking at this, it says the Ministry of Power is the one which has launched this scheme. While the Ministry of Power is, is in relation with energy and electricity, in this case I would like to say it is not the Ministry of Power it seems more appropriate, but rather the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy which is more involved towards giving solar power plants and solar pumps and other things. So, there seems to be a bit of missing and that seems to be a more a favorable choice towards the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy rather than the Ministry of Power. Taking that into account I can say the first statement seems to be a bit missing and I would like to eliminate the first statement. Second statement, it gives a continuous source of income to the rural landowners by utilizing their dry or uncultivable land. Yes, the second statement seems to be right. I would like to go with the second statement alone that is option B 2 only. Let us look at the answer. The answer is answer B. Let us look at the explanation. Statement 1 is not correct because the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy or the MNRE has launched the PM's Kusum scheme for farmers for installation of solar pumps and grid connected solar and other renewable power plants in the country. Whereas the second statement is correct because it will open a stable and continuous source of income to the rural landowners for a period of 25 years by utilization of the dry uncultivable land. So, that is the explanation for PM Kusum and the major ministry involved in that. Let us go for the next question. As per the ease of doing business report of 2020, improvements in which of the following parameters have helped India to improve its ranking? 1. Trading across borders. 2. Protecting minority investors. 3. Starting a business. 4. Getting electricity. 5. Resolving insolvency. Choose the correct code option A 1, 2, 4 and 5 only, option B 2, 3, 4 and 5 only, option C 1, 3 and 5 only and option D all of the above. So, looking at this it talks about the ease of doing business report of 2020. So, this has been present in the news consistently and India has been one of the best performers in the one of the best performers all across the world for improving India's ease of doing business ranking. So, looking at that uh, which of the following parameters have helped India to improve its ranking? It may not be very clear to us to know that India has improved in many cases, but we definitely know for sure that the fifth case that is resolving in insolvency, India has improved a lot with the implementation of the insolvency and bankruptcy code. So, taking that into account, I, I can say that the option 5 should be present in all uh, always. But looking at this, I can say the all option 5 is present in all of the options. But at the same time, protecting minority investors is something which India has not improved drastically or it has actually come back compared to the rest of the indicators. So, this has been present and highlighted in the, all the news reports over the past few news cycles. So, looking at that I can say let us remove option 2. When you remove option 2, you are left with just one option that is option C 1, 3 and 5 only. Looking at that I can say that all of the other options are eliminated and the options 1, 3, 5 are the only ones that are left. So, let us go for option C and let us look at the explanation. The explanation India has climbed 14 rungs in the world, world Bank sees of doing business 2020 survey to stand at the position of 63 among 190 countries, making it the one of world's top 10 most countries for the third consecutive time. India has shown remarkable improvement in these four parameters which are they dealing with construction permits, trading across borders, starting a business and resolving insolvency and it improved from the 77th position to the 63rd position. And India has made the process of obtaining a building permit more efficient, uh, brought about the cost of warehousing, brought about enhancing building quality control in Delhi. Importing and exporting also became easier through the creation of a single electronic platform window. And India saw the biggest jump in, res in resolving insolvency category to 52nd rank from the 108th rank due to the implementation of the insolvency and bankruptcy code. And also improved its dealing with cons construction permits to the 27th position from the 52nd position and trading across borders to the 68th position from the 80th position. Compared with the last years, India's ranking deteriorated only on two parameters that is the protecting minority investors where it went from 7th position to the 13th position 
and getting electricity from the 22nd position to the 25th position and has remained unchanged in enforcing contracts at the 163rd position. So, in all of these three parameters, India score remained unchanged uh, indicating no reforms were recorded by the World Bank. So, that is the explanation for the UODB report and where India has improved and where India has not yet improved and what is India's position. We will go for the next question. In context of tiger orchids, consider the following statements. 1. It is one of the rarest and largest orchids in the world. 2. It is endemic to western guards. Choose the correct code option A 1 only, option B 2 only, option C both 1 and 2 and option D none of the above. So, looking at this I would definitely say that tiger orchid is one of the rarest and largest orchids in the world. It was especially present in the news. But the second statement it is endemic to western guards is wrong because while learning about the tiger orchid as part of your current affairs while learning seeing it in the news it is not endemic to western guards it was not mentioned. So, I would go with the option A 1 only. Now, do not worry because there will be so many species coming about but these you will be learning about them when you learn about the current affairs and you will also be learning about the major species which are endemic or which are you know highly present in the news as part of your environment syllabus uh, coverage under the prelims and mains examination. So, even if you are not aware about it take this opportunity to learn about these new species. Let us go for the explanation. The answer is A. Statement 1 is correct because tiger orchids is one of the rarest and largest orchid in the world that grows under natural conditions. It is also known as the giant orchid because the flowers become massive on attaining maturity. The second statement is not correct because native to the jungles of Myanmar, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand and Papua New Guinea, the plant has big yellow flowers with deep brown markings on them resembling a tiger's coat and that is why it is known as the tiger orchid. The tigers are actually in full bloom at the Jawaharlal Nehru Tropical Botanic Garden and Research Institute, but given the COVID-19 scenario, the public may not get an opportunity to view them this time. Tiger, or tiger orchids, also known as the Gramatophyllum speciosum, so called for their large and resplendent flowers which resemble the tiger skin flowers in alternate years. So, that is the explanation for this question. That is a small explanation about the tiger orchids too, where it is present which is one of the largest and la rarest orchids in the world and where it is native spread is all across. That is the explanation for this question. Now, we are going for the last question. The Justice V S Malimat committee sometimes seen in the news is related with which of the following. A reforms in the criminal justice system, B reforms to improve fertilizers production and trading, C reforms needed in laws regarding concerns uh, crimes against women, D issue advisory against fraudulent websites. So, the Justice V S Malimat committee is something we will be learning about them with regards to reforms in the criminal justice system. This is a very important current affair. We, uh, there has been lots of discussion about the Malimath Committee report. You will also be learning about it as part of your uh, governance and policy uh, subjects while covering your prelims and mains examination. So, the answer is A reforms in criminal justice system. Let us go for the explanation. In 2003, the Justice V S Malimath Committee on reforms in the criminal justice system had come up with some far reaching suggestions, some of which became part of changes in the criminal law. However, it also attracted criticism over the session that the standard of evidence be reduced from beyond reasonable doubt to clear and convincing. The Justice Verma panel came up with a comprehensive and progressive report on reforms needed in the laws concerning crimes against women. So, in this explanation you talked about what is the Justice Malimath Committee report and what is the reform suggestion that. It also talks about the Justice Verma panel which came about on the report on reforms needed in laws concerning crimes against women. So, that is the explanation for this question. With this we are completing part 2b of this video. This is CB Joy signing off. Everybody have a nice day. Thank you.